Thank you. Um, I'm not going to thank the organizers. I will thank you for being for coming here and then for participating to this program. It's nice to to have you in Bangalore, and uh, I hope you have a nice time. Um, so I'll start the two lectures with a basic introductions to large deviations of Markov processes. Um, what I'll be discussing will apply to basically all Markov processes, then we can discuss whether we have a large deviation principle or not, whether we have large deviations in general, but that's something we can, we can leave to the end. So it can, apply, it can be applied to Markov chains, to jump processes or to diffusions, but I'll be focusing on diffusions um, basically for two reasons. One is that I feel more comfortable myself from research with working with diffusions, but also diffusions bring something technical which is quite interesting that you wouldn't see for jump processes in Markov. Of Markov chains. So we'll do this. Uh, so the first lecture is just focusing on large deviations as such, calculating probabilities and estimation of probabilities using large deviation theory. And then tomorrow I'll be talking about how actually a process realizes or create, uh, creates a fluctuation. Okay? And then this is something related to the conditioning of Markov processes, uh, conditioning on large deviations. Um, what I'll be discussing is quite standard, actually. If I look at the composition of the room, half of you know what I'll be talking about. Uh, so this is for students, but I'll try to make it also to go into the technical details, and then you might not know everything. So I hope you'll be learning some stuff too. And if you have some questions, just just you can you can stop me anytime. Although I guess it's a bit difficult with the with the video to <laughs> to stop people. Okay, so the, the the basic problem I think you 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 realize is that. I have a certain process, and this will be a Markov process. Oh, and, and then I have some random variable defined on that process, usually, and then we'll, we'll try to motivate this, but the, the random variables that we're interested to study in physics are time-integrated observables. So I call this, I'm already introducing the name, the word observable. So an observable is just a random variable defined on the process. So it's something that you cannot observe. So I'm going to call this AT, and capital T is just the integration. So typically you have something like this, the integral in time of some function of the state in time. And the goal is to calculate the distribution of that random variable, this observable, in the long time limit. Okay, so I'm interested in something like this, the probability that the random va variable takes some value in subset B, or I can also, from a more physical point of view, look at the whole distribution. So if I have a density, then the probability density that the random variable will take a specific value A. And then if you just attack the problem as it is, you have a process and then you have a random variable, you can, you can try to calculate this exactly, but the point is that this is very difficult, if not impossible in many, many cases. But what you can extract with some work is a kind of exponential estimate of this, which is the large deviation property. So you're going to have something that decays exponentially with some rate that will depend on the set B there. And then if you look at the density, you'll get the same kind of exponential estimate with some exponent that we call the rate function. And so the work is to go into calculating this rate function. Yes? The? You could look at the corrections. We can talk about the corrections. I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details of calculating corrections, but we, we, we could actually discuss this. There's some ways we can obtain corrections. Um, it's not so easy, actually. And then corrections, in, in some cases, are actually very important. Um, but I'll be focusing mostly on getting the dominant exponential order approximation, which is that we call the, the um, large deviation principle. Okay, so that will be the, 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 the goal for today, to actually get these exponential estimates. And the goal for tomorrow is more what I call a prediction problem. If I see a given fluctuations, so this will be a rare event. Okay, this happens with exponentially small probabilities, so it's not something that if you simulate, you'll see happening. You have to actually sample a lot many trajectories, exponentially many trajectories, before you can see it in a, in a direct simulation. So it's a rare event, it's something that happens with a very small probability. Now, if you see it happening in a simulation, then it might happen in some specific way. And so the question for tomorrow is that, how is that 
system creating that fluctuation. If you see it fluctuating away from the typical behavior, how does it do it? Okay, that's the prediction problem for tomorrow. Right. Yes. No. So we'll come to define this as the large deviation principle. That will be the definition. If the distribution has this exponential form, we'll say that it follows a large deviation principle. And so the question is, do we always have a large deviation principle? And the answer is no. Okay. Um, there are very, I can construct very simple processes or very simple uh, random variables that obviously won't satisfy this. Like anything that has a power letel. For instance, if you're dealing with Levy processes and things like this, then the kind of power tells that you have for the process will be transferred over to random variables and so you're going to have power law distributions and they don't have the exponential form so they don't fall into the remit or the, the theory of large deviations. So large deviation theory is not a theory of everything but, but we'll come to see actually that there's some conditions, some clear conditions that will tell you when you have a large deviation principle and then for us in physics it's quite, it's quite large. Uh, it, it, it includes many processes and many random variables, observables that, that we're dealing with. Okay. But it's a very important question, in fact. Oh yes, the rate function will contain, this rate function will contain typical events. We'll see this. Ah. Yeah, then, then it's, it's another theory altogether. If you don't have the large deviation principle, you're just outside of the theory. And then, and then there are other techniques, like uh, to deal with Levy processes, for instance. Um, so, um, but that's really out of the theory. So that will be a, a different talk altogether, a different set of lectures altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are techniques there to get typical behavior and fluctuations. And it just, you, you don't have structure you'll see. The nice thing about large deviation theory is that it's a very nice structure all based on this exponential estimate and it's based on Laplace integrals which keep this um, exponential form and then you have Legend transforms appearing because of the exponential form. When you don't have it you lose all of that nice structure. Mm. You could have other powers. I'm going to give examples where you, you have other powers. So in general, what you have here will be just a certain sequence, a t, a growing sequence, a t there. It could be square root of t, it could be t to some power alpha, but it's a growing sequence in t. Okay? In most cases, and that's called the speed. So a large deviation principle is characterized by the rate function, but also by the t factor here, which we call the speed. And the speed, if it's t, it's, a, it's the standard conventional speed. And in most cases, for ergodic processes that have all moments, then you have the normal speed. Okay, but it's also an important question, actually. I have examples where you don't have that, the normal speed. Okay? Okay, so what I'm going to do is to define the kind of processes that I want to deal with, kind of define also the observable, and then I'll go into the machinery of large deviation theory to see, to show how you calculate this. And again, some of you know that stuff, but um, I'll focus on diffusion because it brings something that's quite interesting in the way that we calculate the large deviations, which you don't see when you're dealing with matrices or jump processes or Markov chains. So the first part is to define the process. So as I said, I'll be looking at diffusion, so I look at a stochastic differential equation of the form dxt is equal to some function capital F dt plus noise, okay, in Gaussian white noise. This is not necessarily in one dimension, so the state is in Rn. The noise can be of different dimensionality, so Rm. So this here will be a matrix of size n times m, and this here will be a vector field, also element of Rn. Okay? And this field we call the force, the drift, it's got different names. I'm going to call it the drift mostly. Um, sigma is the diffusion matrix. I'm not going to write all the assumptions that you need in order to have this process to be ergodic. I'm just going to assume that you have certain f, a certain f and a certain sigma, which is non-degenerate and, and so on and so on, and so you have an ergodic process. Okay, so I'm going to write here ergodic. It's a nice process, it's got nice properties, and I, nice enough that you're going to have a large deviation principle. Okay? 
I could, yes, I, I can. I'm not going to do it because it just brings a lot of technicalities and annotation, and it's a pain when you do a lecture on large deviation. But you could include this in the notes. Actually, I'm not doing this. I should mention this. So everything I'll be discussing is in a set of lecture notes that I was using in August for summer school in Italy. Um, in the notes, I'm, I'm taking sigma to be constant, but you can do the whole theory for the space-dependent sigma. In fact, to do this is an exercise in the lecture notes. <laughs> Okay. So I have 20 exercises at the end of the lecture notes. They're all rated according to difficulty. And then one exercise is to generalize all this for Rn, Rm, but also the sigma dependent on, 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 on space. The, the drift itself is, is space dependent, but it's not time dependent. So you have a homogeneous Markov process that is ergodic. Okay, so that's the mathematical notation. From a physics point of view, this is just a noisy differential equation. So you have an evolution a certain vector using a vector field, and then here you have the sigma, and then you have your Gaussian white noise with the usual property that it's a mean zero um, for all, all time, and then you have t, the delta correlation for the Gaussian white noise. Okay? They're the same system. Um, if you have that differential equation, of course, the paths are not differentiable, but this equation has the meaning of this equation, which is a difference equation in time for a small delta t. Okay, okay so now, in order to characterize that process, it's a Markov process, so you can characterize it in different ways at different levels. There's a first level, which is the level of the distribution of the process, or the density itself, which I'm going to write as Pxt. And then we know that that PDF will evolve according to the Fokker-Planck equation. So the evolution in time of the distribution is given, it's a linear equation, so you have a linear operator, which I'm going to call L dagger there, applied to the density. And the L dagger, we know the form, so it's the gradient, the drift. And then for the, the sigma constant here, it's plus one half. I have the gradient, I have a matrix D, and the matrix D is sigma, sigma transpose. That's for the space-independent case, so that's where the simplification occurs. If you have now the space-dependent sigma, the generator just has a more complicated form, but it doesn't bring anything fundamental in, in the theory, okay? It's just more complicated in annotation. Okay, and then on that side, so this is the evolution in time. If the process is ergodic, I'm going to have a unique stationary distribution, which will be the solution of the equation L dagger applied to the stationary distribution equal to zero. So that's the time-independent stationary distribution. And so that's the eigenfunction of the L dagger with eigenvalue zero. Okay, so that's the kind of marginal description of the, of the stochastic differential equation. Then you have something which is complementary, which is very important in mathematics. Yes, Francois? Yeah, so this is an operator, right? So it would, it would have to be applied on some, on some P. So this is like the vector of gradient in the direction of F that will, you will apply onto some function. Okay? And this is now the same thing. This is matrix times the gradient. This will be a sort of gradient. And then this is like a, a Laplacian. Okay? If, if, if in 1D, then this is uh, just the normal dx times the, 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 the drift, and then here you have the normal second derivative in x. Again? So this is the L dagger applied to the stationary distribution. So this is now the stationary distribution of the process. I'm going to call this PS. Okay, so this is the point, this is the description that we use a lot in physics. We're interested in probabilities and then we want to see how the probability evolves. And then if you have an ergodic process, P of xt will actually converge in the long time limit to Ps. That's the stationary distribution. In maths though, if you, they're more interested in the evolution of expectations of functionals of the process. Okay, so mathematically you write the expectation like this. In physics you would write it like this. So this is just an expectation with respect to p of x t of the function f of x. So it's like a test function. It's an observable that evolves in time. Now, how does it evolve in time? The evolution equation for this 
is also a linear equation. It's another operator applied onto F, and then you evaluate the expectation at that time. Okay, and L in this case is really the dual of L dagger. So it will be F and the, the Laplacian part is self-adjoint, so it's the same thing, but the gradient is skew-symmetric, so when you take the adjoint, this minus sign disappears and then you just invert the order of F and the nabla. Okay, I'll mention in a second in what sense this is a dual. Okay, and I'm just saying now it's the dual of this operator. It's just a kind of dual point of view on the evolution of things. Instead of looking at the evolution of P of XT, you look at the evolution of a test function. And then we'll see later in what sense this is a dual point of view on things. Okay, but essentially they contain the same information. If you can, you can describe the evolution of any test function of the process, you know everything about the process. It's the same as knowing the evolution of the density of the process. Okay? But the reason why I'm presenting this is that it will become important in the calculations of the large deviations. Okay. Um, I could put many examples. To this is the actually this is the, this is a this is an equation. This is the governing equation of the evolution of the expectation of the process. Again. This one. Oh, yeah, the L dagger is this, and then the dual of L dagger is this one here, L. Okay? In physics, then people will call this L, and then this one will be L dagger. I'm just following the mathematical convention where this is the more important point of view, so this is the generator of the process. We call the L the generator of the process, and this is the dual generator. We call this the Fokker Planck generator. So this is the Fokker Planck. generator, because it's the generator of the Fokker-Planck equation, and L in this case is just the generator of the process. Huh? It's not called the Fokker-Planck generator. No. Huh? The backward, oh yeah, 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 it's a, it's a backward Fokker, yeah, yeah. Okay? Okay, so this this includes many many equations, many processes. Like you, if you look at linear process, you're going to have something like the einstein ulenbeck process. Um, what's important from a physical point of view is the reversibility properties or the ir irreversibility properties of the process, whether you have detailed balance or not. Okay, and I can give a whole course on this. I'm not sure I want to go too much into the the details of this. I'm just going to present two examples where you can see the difference. So suppose I have a, a linear diffusion. So example one, I have a linear diffusion of the form dxt is minus some matrix applied onto the state plus the matrix of the noise there, and I take everything to be actually an, an Rn. Okay. Um, okay, I can take a first case where I have sigma, which is proportional to the identity. And physically, this is like putting the same temperature onto all the components of the, of, the, of, the, of the noise. And I can take, say, M to be also the identity. So in this case, the system is purely dissipative. All the, 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 the components actually are getting contracted to a single fixed point, which is at zero. Um, you can write the F as the gradient of a certain function, and that function, you can do the calculation easily, is just um, x squared, the norm actually, like this. And then the stationary distribution is also known. In this case, it's a Gibbs distribution. You have a normalization constant, and then you have 2 u of x divided by sig by epsilon squared. Okay, so you have a Gibbs state. In this case, we say the system is gradient. It is, we know it's reversible. It's got a zero current, a zero focal plane current. You can calculate this. I haven't introduced this, but many of you will know what the focal plane current is. So it's got zero current. It's a fully reversible system. It's an equilibrium system. Okay. Now, as another example, I could take something else. I could take sigma also proportional to the identity, so the same noise, but I could take, say, 
a two-dimensional system where m now would be something like 1, 1, minus 1, 1. So it's not the identity. In this case, the force, the linear force, cannot be written. So the force, which is minus mx, cannot be written as the gradient of some function. In fact, in this case, you can calculate the stationary distribution. It has a stationary distribution, but it's not a Gibbs state. And it has a non-zero current, so it's not a reversible system. Okay, So it's not a gradient system in this case. So you see two very simple diffusion. One is equilibrium, reversible. And the other one is not. So this will be a non-equilibrium. Yes, so this is something general you can prove. If the force is gradient, so even if the force is nonlinear, but it's gradient, then you have a reversible system. Because the current, the focal plane current is zero. Here you can understand where the non-equilibrium nature of the process comes from, because if you, if you plot that, um, that drift, that linear drift in, in as, a vector, as, as a vector field, what you see is that it, it, it has a contracting nature, but there's also some rotation. Okay, so the fixed point is also at zero, so the system has a tendency to go to zero, the noise will push it away from zero, but it's got a rotation part which comes from the off-diagonal element, so there's a rotation in the system, and that, that is what produces the current in the system, and that, this is what it makes it non-equilibrium. Okay, so a very simple example. Now again, I could, I could do a whole course on now on, 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 that, on trying to ask, when do I have a reversible system, when do I have a, a non-reversible system, how can I put conditions on f and sigma? And this is quite rich. Okay? If you're looking only for sigma proportional to, to the identity, then it's really related to whether f is gradient or not. But if you allow then more sigma and space-dependent sigma, then it's very difficult to put conditions. I could have a gradient f, but a non-diagonal sigma, and it would still be non-equilibrium. Okay, this will represent, for, in for instance, a system where I have many temperatures in my system. The force could still be gradient, but I can have a current in that case, even though I have a gradient force. Okay, so it's quite rich. I don't want to go in that direction. I just want to point to you that there's something there. And then for us, for the, the large deviation calculations, it will play a role. Whether you have an equilibrium or non-equilibrium system actually will play a role in the way that you calculate the large deviations and in the way that it will make the calculation easy or difficult. Okay, and then there's, there's, quite, there's lots of physics also buried uh, behind this. So you can see the reversibility in, in many sense. You have, you can say, there's the, the definition based on the zero of the, of the probability current, the focal plane current. There's also the definition, I think you know, on whether if I have, say, a path whether I have, if I reverse the path, whether I have the same probability. So this is more like the physical picture of reversibility at the path level. Um, um, then you have, you can also look at the spectrum of the generator to see if it's complex or real. So there are different notions of reversibility. And then for gradient system, if you have sigma which is proportional to the identity, then this dichotomy of gradient, non-gradient is all equivalent to all the other definitions that we know. Okay. But then, in some cases, it's not so clear. So, um, but I would take that to be like the ultimate definition of reversibility, and then you can relate this also to detailed balance. So this will be equivalent to detailed balance for Markov, for Markov processes. Okay. Okay, so, I'm, so that, that's the context. I have a process, and now I've, I've discussed this duality between the L and the L dagger. And, and if, you, if you're from physics and you've done quantum mechanics, you know what the dual the dagger is. But here, actually, I want to explain the meaning of this dagger, the meaning of the dual, because there's a difference between quantum mechanics and the theory of Markov process. This, the difference is that we're not using the same notion of scalar product. So the notion of dual is not the same as in quantum mechanics. Okay, so I'm just going to do a small detour now into the theory of non-emission operators. Why I'm doing this is because if you look at the, the generator or the, the focal plane generator, you'll see you have 
a self-dual part. So this is emission, that part, but this is not emission. When I take the dual, you see it changes to something else. Okay? So unless you have f equals zero, you'll be dealing with non-emission operators. So you're not doing quantum mechanics from the start. Okay? You have to deal with something slightly more complicated. And if you want to, to make a joke, you could say that quantum mechanics is actually included in classical stochastic processes as a particular case of emission operators. <laughs> okay? It's a bit pushing it. Okay, so the notion of dual for us is based on this scalar product. So the scalar product that we're using is a natural scalar product suggested by the notion of expectation. The expectation of a function it's just the integral of px f of x for some distribution, and you see it looks like a scalar product. And so I'm going to define this as my scalar product of p contracted with f. Okay? It's a linear functional of, of f or of p. So it's not the usual scalar product that you have in quantum mechanics, and the dual then is defined with respect to that scaling product. So if you have something that an operator applied on F, then the definition of duality is just that there will be a dual operator now acting on P instead. So this is how you define duality. What applies, what, what is acting on a state will be acting on the dual space. So here I have two dual spaces. I have the space of test functions. And then the dual of this, and this is the space of normalized probability distributions. Okay, which is not like the Hilbert space of quantum mechanics, where you have the same space on the two sides. Okay, Hilbert space being um, um, uh, self-conjugated. So this is the, the scalar product. And then the meaning you can you can convince yourself that what I've written here is actually consistent with that notion of scalar product. So what I the dagger is the dual with respect to. We say it's the dual with respect to the Lebesgue measure, because the scalar product here involves the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so that's the dual that we're using in the theory of stochastic process. Now, if, if you realize this, then you realize really like the that the Fokker Planck is conjugate to this equation in a trivial way. If I have this equation, I have to have this equation, and vice versa. And actually, that, this is a way to derive the, the Fokker Planck equation very simply. So if I look at the evolution of this, in terms of scalar product, this is just the evolution of the scalar product of the time-dependent density with the, contracted with f. Okay? We know this is equal to, according to the first mathematical relationship, to L being applied on f. Well, by duality, then, this has to be L dagger applied on the, time, on the density instead. And this is true for any f for which you have the expectation, so you have to have the Fokker Planck equation. Okay. If you accept this equation here, then you have a two liner proof of the Fokker Planck equation. And now, so this is true for, so for, the, for the, the linear algebra structure, it's true for any Markov processes, not necessarily for diffusion. In our context, though, because the, the generator is a differential differential operator, the notion of duality is just integration by part. Okay? If you look at the jump process, then the generator will be a matrix, and so the duality will just be the transpose. But in our case, uh, duality is just um, the integration by parts. So if I look at a differential operator, just a nabla, differential operator, then I'm going to have something like this. If I have a certain p, and then I take the nabla of f, how do I transpose the nabla on the other side? Well, it's integration by parts. So this will be p gradient of x dx. So then by integration by part, I'm going to have pf onto some boundary of my problem. OK, everything will be on some space. And so you have the boundary on that space. And then here, you're going to have then um, the gradient of p, f, dx. Okay, and this is why I said the gradient is Q-symmetric, because when you do the dual, you're going to get a minus sign for the integration by part, and then now the nabla is applied on p. 
Now, this is true if this is equal to zero, so it will be very important that we're in a space where that boundary term is equal to zero, otherwise you have to carry that constant all the time. We don't want to do this. Okay? So this is also part of the definition of the scalar product. This is the scalar product, and again, we're going to take p's and f such that on the boundary, which for us will be mostly at infinity, at infinity, p times f has to be zero. Okay? Really important. This is one technicality that arises for diffusion. You see, you don't, if you know jump processes or Markov chains, you don't have any of this, because you're only dealing with the matrix, and the dual is just a transpose. Okay, one other, one other difference with quantum mechanics now is that because I have a, a non-emission problem, if, if I define a kind of eigenvalue problem, there will be a difference too. So, the eigenvalue problem, or the eigen problem if you want, now involves two sides. I have two sets of eigenvectors. I can have an eigenvalue problem like this, and because my problem is non-emission, if I look at the problem for the dual, I'm going to have a different set, in general, of eigenfunctions. The spectrum, you might think, oh, will be different too, but what you can show is that the spectrum is just a complex conjugate of the, the dual problem. Okay? But the u and the v's will be different in general. If your operator is emission self-adjoint, then the u will be equal to v. That's the quantum case. But in general, we're going to have different eigenfunctions for the, the direct problem. I'm going to call this, this one the direct, and this is the dual. However, we still have the same property of quantum mechanics that the u and the v's will form a complete basis in many cases. Okay? So that's not always the case, but for us it's the case. Yes? Is a? A normal. Oh, this is... No, if I have a spectrum for the direct problem, then the spectrum for the dual problem will just have this property. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have, so if you look at the relationship between the two problems, I'm going to have this, so I can just move this one here. Um, I also have the orthogonality of the U and the Vs, and also have the completeness relationship between the Us and the Vs that you would expect in quantum mechanics. Now, the only difference is that you have to deal with x, v, x prime, okay? So you have the same notion of a complete base, but now the basis is constructed with the u's and the v's, not just with the u's, which you would have, like if you had a single psi in quantum mechanics, because you have an emission problem, the, the psi itself, the set of eigenfunction, will form a complete basis. Here, it's the same structure. This is linear algebra for non-emission operators, and you have the same result. Okay? So this is the orthogonality, orthogonal, and this is the completeness relationship between the eigenfunctions. Okay, this will be very important because at some point we'll be doing spectral analysis. We want to decompose function onto some basis. How do I construct that basis? Well, it's going to be the eigenbasis of my generator. But now I just have to be careful to think that the basis is not constructed from a single set of eigenfunctions because my generator or operator in general is not their mission. So mathematically, no. For, for, the, for us, there will be some conditions on having, say, a potential that's confining enough. Like It's the same kind of condition you have in quantum mechanics. If you have a discrete spectrum, if you have a continuous spectrum. So the completeness, mathematically, is quite it's a difficult problem, of course. It's not something that's trivial. I'm going to just push aside all this technicality to say, yes, you can always make that. that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But now we're talking about an operator. It's a differential operator, right? So in a way, what we're doing is more like the Schrodinger picture of quantum mechanics because we have a differential operator. If you're doing jump processes or Markov chains, then it's more like a spin kind of perspective where you have matrices, you're dealing with matrices, like the Eisenberg picture. Yes? So this is the class, so this is... Um, the class of functions for which the expectation is, is, is finite. P 
Here is the set of normalized probability distribution. So that, that, that is, is just well defined. It's there. And then the set, the, the space for the observable, so we call the F the observables or the test function, it's the whole test function for which you have essentially this norm being finite. It depends. Um, yeah, yeah, I had this question before. I think it. Yeah, yeah. In this case, you'll have the same. In fact, yeah, yeah. Yes, but um, I think it depends how I define my. Maybe it's because here actually, I could have a transpose. I could have the complex conjugate here, but not on the p, but say on the f. But let's take this one actually, maybe up to some. Possible corrections. I had that question. I wasn't sure actually. Also in Italy, when I was giving the summary, the yeah, yeah. I think that's the yeah, 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 yeah. There was another question, no? Okay. So that that's the. This is the process. I just want to make this point very clear. It's something actually that took me a long time to to recognize and realize. Although. Once you know it, it's kind of trivial. You're dealing with a non-emission operator, so you just have this, the whole spectral decomposition stuff that, that we're going to use eventually. You just have to be a bit more careful in knowing what kind of scalar product that you're using. Also, the, the scalar product is not unique, right? I could use another notion of scalar product, and in fact, I'll be doing this eventually if I have time. I'm going to change the notion of scalar product, and then you know that if you change the scalar product, you're not changing the spectral properties of your operator. So if an operator has say, a real spectrum in some spectral product, then it's going to have also a real spectrum with respect to another scalar product. Okay, and then we'll come to see this. In fact, the spectrum is defined with respect to a notion of scalar product. This is something we forget, actually, a lot in quantum mechanics. If I give you the Hamiltonian and I say, oh, what are the energies, what are the eigenvalues, then we just compute the eigenvalues. These are the eigenvalues defined with respect to a given scalar product, and in fact, given certain boundary conditions too. Okay, it's something we, we forget. So you cannot really talk of the eigenvalues of an operator. It's the eigenvalues or the spectrum of an operator with respect to a scalar product. Okay, so this is for the process. Now let's move on to the observables. I'm going to call them dynamical observables. So um, I put the integral in time, but I have to enlarge that class a bit because actually when you start doing physics, you realize that there are many random variables that are not just the time integral of some function of the state. Okay, so the class of observable I'll be looking at is made of random variables that have a part that can, that can depend on the state of my process, but also I can have a part that depends on some function g, and then with now the increment of the process. And I'm going to put the product, the g times dx. When, whenever you deal with a stochastic integral, you have to define now which calculus you'll be using. Ito, Stratanovich, and T Ito, and then so on. And then, just for simplicity, I'm going to use the Strato, Stratanovich product um, to make things easier, actually. The mathematics is just easier. But I could use the Ito product if I wanted. It's, it's, it's no big deal. There's also a physical reason why you would want to use the Stratonovich product, and then I'm going to explain this in a minute. Okay, so what's the meaning, what's the meaning of this? So the Stratonovich product just means that I take the midpoint rule. So it just means that if you have an increment of the state, you just take the midpoint, and then you multiply by the increment. Okay, so in a way, the Stratonovich product is like a Nito product, but with the midpoint rule. And the meaning of this now, if you think about this, is that I have a time integrated part which depends just on the state. Yes. Thank you. And there's another part that will depend on the speed. I have x dot and dt. Okay, so this is, in a way, the interpretation, the physical interpretation is that I have something which is purely integrated in time and something now that is integrated in time but involves the speed or the, the, the current of the process. 
Now again, the process itself is not differentiable anywhere, so the x dot has no meaning rigorously. So the rigorous meaning now is to, as a stochastic integral, and then, as always, when you have a stochastic integral, you have to define the convention you're using for the stochastic calculus. Okay, so this is the Stratanovich, Stratanovich product. Okay. Uh, I think I... Uh, no, you couldn't because uh, X dot doesn't exist. Yeah? Um, but I don't think there are any examples where you would need this anyway. Yes, but um, if you think about the jump process picture too, we, we're just summing observables that depend on the state before the jump and the state after the jump. So it's included in a way in this, right? And then the diffusion limit of this will be something like this. So it could be that even that picture could, can be transformed in that picture where, where you put the x dot part on this side. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look at some examples. Why, why do we look at this? Mathematically, I'm going to consider a class of observables of this form. Now, why do I do this? Because all examples of physical observables that we've been studying in this field called stochastic thermodynamics have this form. Okay, so, for instance, the potential energy. If I have a gradient system, then I have a potential, and if I look at the variation of the potential energy over some time, so it will be the potential energy at the final time minus the potential energy at the initial time. This is a, a random variable, and this is the gradient of the process, but Stratanovich. Yes. Yes. Between zero and T. Okay, for conservative force, the work is the difference, difference in potential energy. But this only works if you take the Stratanovich product. If you take the Ito product, you don't get this. So the normal rule of calculus, where now this integral has to be the, 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 the value of the function at two different points, at the end points, is true for Stratanovich. Stratanovich will keep the normal rules of calculus. Ito, no. Okay? So this is one reason, physically, why you want to use Stratanovich calculus because it just gives you the correct interpretation of the thermodynamic formula, the energy um, quantities that you'll be, you'll be looking. And this it will be the same for the work. So if you have a certain force, then the work done over a time interval t should be defined as the force times the displacement, but the displacement in Stratanovich sense. There's another one, an interesting one, which is we call the entropy production. The entropy production is essentially the work, production, sigma t is the integral of d minus 1f, Stratanovich dxt. Okay, and this is related to the reversibility properties that we, we were mentioning before. There are other ones. Um, one that is really important in the mathematical theory of large deviation is the empirical density. Uh, Frank has been using that quantity a lot last week, is essentially the histogram of visited states over time. Okay, and then you see this is a purely, a pure time integral. And then you can also, for a stochastic process, for a Markov process, look at the empirical current. So this is kind of the empirical velocity of the process. So we call this the empirical current. This is a functional a function of time and space. It will be 1 over t. Uh, this, sorry, this is the delta here. This is a delta function. Delta function minus x. And then Stratanovich dx. OK, and then you can see this essentially if you put the dx at x dot dt, it's like an empirical distribution for the velocity. Okay, these are very formal quantities. I'm just integrating a delta. Of course, you would have to smooth out the delta in space and so on, but you, you get the point. This is the number of times I visit, the fraction of time that I spent in x. This is the, the sort of the mean velocity at the point x over time. Okay? 
Okay, and then you see they have the form of the observable I had there. For this one, I'm going to have f equals zero, g equals the gradient of u. Same thing here, same thing here. I have it only g, only the g part, no f part. So same thing here, f equals zero, g is equal to d minus one f. This one, this is a purely f observable, there's no g. So f is equal to the delta, g is equal to zero, and this one is the other way around. Again? D minus one. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, why the D minus one? Or? D my, the D was my diffusion. Yeah. Diffusion matrix. Essentially, this is to relate the entropy production to the temperature. That's why I have this one there. Okay? So what I claim is that it's a big claim. It's just a claim up to now. Up to now, all the physical observables that we've been dealing with have this form. So it makes sense to build a theory uh, for this class of observable. In, in mathematics, they usually look only at this kind of observable, purely time integrated. But for physics, it's really important that you consider something like this. And it's going to change the theory a bit. And in fact, that, that modification is not contained in the mathematical literature. It's something that we'll do together to build a large deviation theory, now including this possibility too. Again? Just because if you want to deal with, in physics, with observables of this type, then they're not purely integrated in time. And you, I cannot change this to just a pure time integral. I just can't. It's a stochastic integral, and so I have to include this in the theory. Again? So all the theory you're going to see this, all the theory that we'll present will depend on this f and the g. Okay? So the meaning of the f and the g depends on the system you'll be looking at. Okay? So you'll see everything will be parameterized by f and the g. So I'm going to just do the general theory for f and g. But of course, depending on your system, you're going to have a specific f and a specific g, just like here. In this case, I have no f. The g is the gradient. It just depends on the physical observable that you look at. In the same way that when I look at my process, the capital F is defined by the process that I look at. Okay, so what I'm going to have in the end here, and I should put here, is that my process will give me a given F and sigma. That defines the F and sigma. That's the process. And then the observable, that's the process here, the observable will define me an F and a G. Uh, no, the, I'm using the same f, but now the f is different, right? I don't need to have the conditions that I had before that the f has to be integrable. Yeah, sorry. Yes, I'm using the same f as a test function. Should have used phi here. I think I use phi in the notes. Yes. Hmm. So the whole thing here will depend, it depends on the increment, of course. So the whole thing here will be, you have something that, I hesitate to write this, but it, it will depend on something like h, t, and t plus dt, right? Yeah, so it will be the state before the jump and the state after the jump. And in fact, the theory is based like this for the, the jump processes. You, you're going to have a part of the observable which is time integrated, it depends on the state, and then you're going to have another part which, which, which depends only on the jumps, the jump size or the, the state before the jump and after the jump. And the diffusion limit of that term is basically this. Okay, okay I realize I'm, I'm spending lots of time on the technical details, but I'm fine with that. If, if I don't finish, it's, I'm, I'm fine with... with uh, with that. We can continue tomorrow anyway. Okay, so now I've got all the ingredients. I have the process, I have the observable, so now we want to calculate the distribution of the observable. I want to calculate again. I have a certain PDF for distributions. I'm gonna write as a physicist, okay? Um, 
I haven't said that AT is a continuous random variable that has a density, but I'm going to assume it has a density. And so when I write the P of AT, it's because it has a density. Mathematically, it's a big assumption. You don't need that assumption. In, in mathematics, they, they'd rather actually write something like, and this is what Frank was doing last week, the probability for your random variable to be part of a set B, and then you can look at closed and open sets, and then you can define an upper bound, a lower bound that will have exponential behavior in your parameter, and this is how you define the large deviation principle. Here I'm going to simplify everything to, the, to a very simple form, but just to give the ideas behind large deviation, uh, large deviation theory. And the basic idea is the large deviation principle. is this expon exponential approximation. So we're going to say that the distribution has a large deviation principle if the density or the distribution is exponentially it's exponential in time, it decays exponentially in time, approximately with time in this form. And now you have to make sense of this wiggle approximation. What do we need by this? It means that if you take the log, You're going to have the linear term, which is the dominant term in time, plus something, a correction in time that will be smaller than linear in time. So small o of t. Okay, so if you look at the exponential approximation, it means that if I put an equal sign here, I'm going to have corrections in the exponent. And so the corrections are smaller than time, so the dominant part of the distribution will be this exponential of time. Okay, again, you could have different speed, but I'm just going to make the assumption that you have the normal conventional speed here. So it means that if you want to extract the non-dominant behavior, what you should do is that you should take the limit, when time goes to infinity, of minus 1 over t, the log of the distribution. And if you do this, you're going to kill this term, you're going to take the t out, and then all you get is a rate function. Okay, so this is called the rate. So we're going to say that the distribution satisfies a large deviation principle, LDP. So I'm going to use LDP now. If the limit here exists and define a rate function which is not zero everywhere or infinite everywhere. Okay? And then, mathematically, you might think, oh, this is just applicable in the infinite time limit. No. The limit here only defines the rate function. The meaning of the LDP is that the distribution itself, for a very large time, will decay exponentially with time. And so the dominant part of the distribution is the exponential. So although the rate function is defined as a limiting function, the LDP is, is actually a statement for finite time, but very long time. It's a scaling of the distribution. And in fact, it's a very good approximation of the distribution for the large time because the corrections are sub-exponential in time. If you know the power of the exponential, then if you have that exponential in anything which is not exponential, the exponential is winning big time. So you shouldn't even care about the corrections, although you can. And then at some time, in some cases, it's important to look at the corrections because you can find out that the rate function is zero in some places. And so now you have to go to the next order to get the correct information. Okay, so this is really important. Yes? Again? The, 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 the A here is just, it's a function. What's important in the LDP is that A, I of A does not depend on time. So the scaling of the distribution is a picture where you have only the rate that tells you the decay, and then you have that decay with exponential in time. But this could be log T. Now, we'll see, we'll see actually some properties of the rate function. The rate function has to be positive. Behind the LDP, there's a picture of concentration, which is really important. And then um, you don't have it in your picture, for instance. Also, uh, Sanjib and Abhishek, they look at the scaling of a distribution, which is not quite the LDP. It's just a scaling of, this, of a distribution, which you can call the LDP if you want, but it's not a pure LDP in the sense that it doesn't have a large, large number behind, or there's no central limit theorem, okay? And so this, this is kind of important, but it will, it will take me quite far in the, in the theory. But the basic picture, and I'm going to put this here, is that 
Here you have a picture of concentration. In order to have an LDP and to, and to talk in a meaningful way about an LDP, you have to have a concentration first, a law of large numbers. So that P of A in the long time limit goes to a delta or multiple deltas. There's concentration. What you're doing with the LDP is to characterize that concentration. You're saying that the distribution concentrates exponentially on certain points that will have essentially the rate function equal to zero. When the rate function is not equal to zero, it's positive, and so the density there decays exponentially. If it decays exponentially everywhere, it has to concentrate somewhere, and this will be where the rate function is zero. So th the classic picture of the LDP is something like this. You can have a rate function which is not necessarily convex, but it's positive. Always, you can prove that if you have an LDP, the rate function has to be positive. This will give you, this is the rate function. Now, what's the picture for the probability? The picture for the probability is that for a certain time, you can have a density like this. And then when you increase time, then the rate function here is positive. So here it has to go down. But the speed at which it goes down is a bit lower than here or here. So it's going to be like this. But you see here it doesn't go down. The rate function is positive. So it's going to concentrate now for a longer time like here. And then if you increase time again, it will concentrate where the rate function is zero. And the zeros of the rate functions are really important. Okay, I'll come back on this actually in the properties of another quantity. Yes. Yes, exponentially fast because of the LDP. But there are funny cases. You can have a rate function, and again, I'm just going on a tangent here. You can have a rate function that has a whole line of zeros. What's happening here? We don't know, because the rate function only gives you the dominant order. If the, if the rate function has a whole line of zero, it means that the behavior now is determined by the next order. So here you could have, it doesn't mean that the density will concentrate here, it just means that you have sub-exponential behavior in that region. Okay, so you have to be a bit careful. If the rate function is as only one zero, then the picture is fine, it's stable. Everything decays exponentially, so it has to concentrate exponentially on the zero of the rate function, and this will be the typical value of your random variable. It's the ergodic value, it's the law of large number. Okay, I'll come back on this in, in a minute. Yeah? Okay, so what do we have? So we have the LDP, we'll be dealing with the LDP as an exponential approximation of a distribution. Again, if you go into the problem of calculating that distribution exactly, you're going to be stuck. Even for independent random variables, it's very difficult to get the exact distribution. But the point again is that you shouldn't even attempt to get the exact If you have an LDP, you'll be spending a lot of work getting the exact distribution, but it's dominated by an exponential anyway, so forget about the corrections, okay? That's my point of view. Then we can talk about corrections, there could be some, something actually, when you look at phase transition, it could be important to look at the corrections. Okay, but for now, we just adopt a typical physicist lazy approach of let's minimize our work, most of the information is in the rate function anyway. Okay, and it's, it will be difficult enough to get the rate function. So, uh, yes, exactly, that, that's something else too. So, you could do a Gaussian approximation of the distribution. That will be the easiest approach to get the distribution. Then you'll get local information about the zero and then, the, the, say, locally Gaussian fluctuation. Maybe it's good enough for you. It was good enough for physicists for about 50 years. Now we're saying, well, we want a bit more. We want more information. For instance, what about this region, if I have this region? It's not going to be characterized by my Gaussian approximation. I'm going to miss it completely. Maybe for an insurance company, this is not good enough. And so you want something more than Gaussian approximation, which is the central limit theorem. And the whole theory started with this. So in, in 38, 1938, Harald Kramer was working on some insurance problems in actual science, and then he wanted to go beyond the central limit theorem in order to get a better estimate of the tail probabilities. And this is how large deviation started. And now what we're doing in physics is more or less applying the same thing. We could do Gaussian approximations. I guess we wouldn't go very far with that. A lot of nice physics is actually buried in the tails. And then we have now a theory to go to get information about the tails. And this is why it's called large deviations. We have information now about the small fluctuations around the mean, but also the large fluctuations far away from the mean. Okay? Okay, so now the goal is to prove, so we have a process, an observable, we want to prove that we have an LDP and then we want to get that rate function. Once we have the rate function, 
we have essentially all the information we need about the distribution of the observable. You can view also the, the rate function as just plotting the distribution on a log scale. Log 1 over t scale. And then that, that's just as much information, at least on the exponential scale, in the rate function as in the distribution. Okay, so how are we going to do... What are we going to use now to, 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 to prove the LDP and then get the rate function? There are many techniques for this, um, but I'm going to present the gartner ellis theorem, which is the one that we, we've been using quite a lot. So this, it's a nice result about enlarged deviation theory. Gartner was 1977, and Ellis generalized the result like soften the condition in 84. And the result goes as follows. We're going to define what we call the scale cumulant, scale cumulant generating function. Okay, and then I'm going to call scale cumulant generating function like this. So it's a function of a real parameter. It's a limit function when t goes to infinity of 1 over t log the expectation of t k a t, with k being a real parameter. Okay? So the expectation is a generating function. When you take the log, it's a cumulant function. And because of the limit, we call this the scale cumulant generating function. The theorem in its simplified form, I'm not going to give all the, the condition, but the, the simplified form, which actually comes from Gartner, is the following. If lambda k exists and is differentiable in the neighborhood of k equals zero, I'm not putting everything there, then you have an LDP. So your random variable has an LDP. And the rate function is the Legendre transform of your lambda k. Okay, so you get exactly what you are after. You want to prove that the random variable has an LDP, and then you want to get the rate function. And so the goal now, the game, will be to try to calculate this lambda k, of course, not knowing the LDP, which that's what we're after. So we'll see how we can calculate this lambda k. And then we have to check this differentiability property, and then we're going to get the LDP and the rate function. Okay, the soup is just a maximization. If it's differentiable, if, if this is strictly convex, then you can use just a Legendre transform. So this form is a slightly generalized form of the Legendre transform, which is called the legendre Fenkel transform. Okay. This is not the ultimate result in large deviation theory because a byproduct of this result is that the rate function will be convex. Any Legendre transform of a convex function, lambda k is always convex actually by definition, any Legendre transform of a convex function will give you a convex function. So this shows in fact that if you, your rate function is not convex, it, and a rate function can be non-convex, if it's non-convex then you cannot obtain it using the Gartner-Ellis theorem. Uh, it's um, some inequality, I don't remember the name of it, it's the usual... Uh, the? Yeah, it's in the physics report. <laughs> okay, lambda k is convex. Uh, there's some properties, actually I'm going to list these properties in a second. It's got some nice properties, but the Legendre Fenkel transform will give you a convex rate function. And so this in general will be, actually, if you apply blindly the gartner ellis theorem, it will give you the convex envelope of the true rate function. So if your rate function is convex, then you get the right convex function. Yeah, so the, the thinking now, the, the wisdom in the large deviation for Markov processes is that any time integrated observable of a Markov process, if you have an LDP, the rate function has to be convex. Okay, and there's a basic separation argument that Alex is actually alluding to that will show that, that the rate function has to be convex. And mathematically, this argument is, is related to what we call subadditivity. So there's a subadditivity argument for proving that the rate function of a convex of a, of a Markov process has to be convex. But there are examples of non-convex rate functions. They come, for instance, from 
equilibrium statistical mechanics. There are spin models that have non-convex uh, rate functions. And there's a whole section in the physics reports about this. And, and what it means for the lambda k if you have a non-convex. And this is related to the differentiability property. This is actually convex analysis. The Legendre transform of a non-convex rate function gives you a non-differentiable function. So non-convexity by Legendre transform is related to differentiability. And this is why you have that differentiability condition here. Okay, this is really nice. In the, in the theory of convex function, this is a, a nice duality between non-convex parts or flat parts and non-differentiable points. Okay, there's quite a lot there. Um, Uh, this is a very important question, I guess it will be a question for Erez, but if you're dealing with Le Levy processes of things like this, the lambda k does not exist. So this is why you don't have an LDP. So, so if the LDP doesn't show up, it will show up by having a blowing L lambda k. And then you see why this is, because this is a generating function. If you have blowing, if a moment actually diverges, then the generating function will diverge as well. Okay. But it's not with the convexity, it's really with the convergence of the moment. Here I could have a non-convex rate function, but I could have an LDP. It's really in the... So whenever you have an LDP, all the moments are nice. That's what it means. Okay? So if you, if you start touching Levy processes, you're not going to have this. But then there's some cases, there's some limit cases. For instance, log normal distributions. They don't have a lambda k, but they have a large deviation principle. Okay? So it's, it's quite subtle here the boundary of having finite moments or, or not finite moments. Mm -hmm. Like a stopping time in the... You could have this, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, so that could be actually also, I guess it doesn't fall into the subadditivity argument for the convex rate function, if you had on top of the observable, instead of having just fixed time there, a random time, a random stopping time. Okay, so the time is running out now. I haven't even started doing calculations, so now comes the, the main result for the lecture. I want to find a large deviation principle, I want to find the rate function, but now it's all about calculating this, okay? This lambda k. How do I calculate this? This is the big result. So if you look at some of ID random variables, you see that this, actually now not with time, but with the number n of random variables, has a simple form. If you look at, um, if you look at Markov chains, you, you, you see that this is related to a dominant eigenvalue of some matrix. And then for diffusion, what you have is a kind of functional peron Frobenius result where the result is that the scale cumulative generating function lambda k is the dominant eigenvalue of some modification of the generator that we call the tilted generator. And this is the main result. This is for Markov processes. For Markov processes, additive observable of this form the lambda k is the dominant eigenvalue of this generator. It's nabla plus kg dot f plus one half nabla plus kg d nabla plus kg plus kf. Okay, you see this is, this is still a differential operator, a linear operator. Uh, um, you see the two function f and g appearing, so they, they, it's parameterized by the observable that it depends on the observable that I look at. Um, if you have a look, if you put k equals zero, this is just a normal generator you had before, so it's a deformation of the original generator. The part that was known from mathematics is the part where you put g equal to zero, then it's just a linear tilting of the generator. Now the new thing that appears when you look at the current related observable with the g is that you're just shifting the nabla. It's like a gauge transformation. Okay. 
Okay, so now you see, in order to get the rate function, I need to get a dominant eigenvalue, so I reduce my problem into a spectral problem. Okay, I need to find a dominant eigenvalue. How am I going to do this? Well, I look, if I can, I'm going to find the whole spectrum, I just extract the dominant eigenvalue. Numerically, there are better algorithms just to extract the dominant eigenvalue. But the difficulty now is that I need to find the dominant eigenvalue of a non-emission operator. Now, what do I know? This, this I know is a real eigenvalue by Perron Frobenius. Okay, essentially, I'm using Perron Frobenius in a differential operator sense. There's not much actually on the theory side, so I'm just stretching the mathematics here. It's a very difficult problem to prove that kind of result. There are some conditions on the generator, on the system that you look at. I'm just putting this away. I'm just assuming that there's a dominant eigenvalue, there's a gap in the spectrum, and this is the result you get. Small. So F is the drift of your of your diffusion. Okay, so originally in your process you have two quantities that is in your process, the drift and the sigma, and the D there is the sigma times sigma transpose. Okay, so the D is the same D here, sigma, sigma transpose. The small t, where's the small t? Ah, uh, g. G is the g appearing here. You have the F and the G. So this is the large deviation for this quantity. So this quantity involves F and G. And so you have this. Okay. Where? No, because I'm looking at the mathematician's generator. Okay. Now the dominant eigenvalue will be the same as if I take the transpose. So I could have um, this. Oh, no, no, sorry, sorry, you're right. right, 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 right yeah. In that form, there will be a minus sign, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm using the mathematician's notion of generator. So the generator for this should be F times delta. Okay, it's not the Fokker-Planck generator. But of course, the dominant eigenvalue of the Fokker-Planck, the modified Fokker-Planck generator will be the same because the dual for the dominant eigenvalue will be a real eigenvalue. Okay, so we know a few things about the spectrum now. If this, the dominant eigenvalue is real, it's the same as the dominant eigenvalue of the, the tilted Fokker-Planck generator. Here I'm just tilted the generator. It also shows that here the dominant eigenvalue of the generator itself would be zero because I know that the lambda at zero is zero by normalization of the scale cumulative generating function. And then we know this too. If you have a generator of the Fokker-Planck generator, the dominant eigenvalue is the eigenvalue associated with the stationary distribution. All eigenvalues will have negative real parts. Okay, so there's lots of spectral properties behind this, and the large deviation result is extracting the dominant eigenvalue, and the reason for this is because you're dealing with a long time limit. So the long time limit is dominated by the dominant eigenvalue. Okay, and it's something I want to to actually explain here, this result comes from the feynman katz formula. Okay, so I'll do this, and then we'll try to do a specific example, and I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. Question. There's some assumptions. Okay, so here, and then these assumptions will become clear, actually, as I do the kind of proof of this result. Okay, so this is... Why do I have this result? It's because of the feynman katz formula. Okay, I'm going to need some space. Remember, I have, it's all based on this generating function. I want to evaluate the scale cumulative generating function, but it all starts with this generating function. So I'm going to write one generating function, which is a slightly modified generating function. It's the expectation started at x of small t k a t. Or in fact, let me not even write this. Let me write something general. 0 a t and then some function c of the process. Okay, what's the meaning of this expectation? It means that you take the expectation of your, expansion, your, your exponential functional. This we call a cat's type functional, 
and then the little x means that you're starting your process at x. So this is a function of x and t. It changes in time, and it's a function of f of x that changes in time. This, amazingly, evolves according to a linear equation. We know that the distribution according to Fokker-Planck actually evolves linearly uh, with the Fokker-Planck generator. Here, there's an equation of evolution for j of xt, and it's a linear equation, and that equation is called the Feynman-Katz equation. And the initial condition for this equation, if you put zero time, it will be one. Okay, so that's the Feynman-Katz equation. This is an amazing equation if you think about it. Uh, the reason why you have this linear equation is because that G has a multiplicative structure in time. Because of the Markov process, the distribution of the Markov process itself has a multiplicative structure in time. And then the exponential keeps that, expon that multiplicative structure. Okay, you can think of the exponential as exponential of a sum, so you have an infinite product of exponential. So that combines with the multiplicative structure of the Markov process, and so that G itself is exponential in time, and so it evolves linearly in, in increments. Okay, so I can write, in fact, the solution formally, because it starts with one, it's time, the... Well, I have what I shouldn't write. Sorry, it's not L of k. I should write L of c because everything now depends on c. Here, L of c, L of c is L plus c. And so here, I start with the initial condition. I propagate the one according to the generator. This is the generator of the evolution, and this is evaluated at x. Okay, so this is just the formal solution of a linear equation. Okay, you have the same thing in quantum mechanics. You have the, you have the Schrodinger's equation, here you're going to have your h, and then the solution, the psi of xt, is the propagator. The propagator is t times h, with your initial condition. So here the initial condition is just one. You propagate this, this is your propagator if you want. This is the propagated solution. Okay? Okay, so... Now, it's a linear equation, so I can project that equation into the eigenbasis of the, of the modified generator. So this is the feynman cast generator. You see it's modified because I have the C. Okay. And so now I could, I could write this in spectral form if I wanted, but now you have to be careful again. It's a non-emission operator in general, so if you expand this in, 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 in spectral form, you're going to have the different eigenvalues. So the, the time dependence is purely in the eigenvalues, just like in quantum mechanics. And then I'm going to have some function here, u of x, with, I'm going to have many eigenfunctions, all the different eigenfunctions. And this is where the, now the assumptions this is where you're going to need some assumptions. How can I write this? If I write something like this, I'm assuming that I have a discrete spectrum. If I don't have a discrete spectrum, I should have an integral, but then you have to be careful. It doesn't really make sense. But if I have a gap, now you see, in the long time limit, this will be nominated by the dominant eigenvalue. And so behind this result is the assumption of a gap. So here, in the long time limit, this is all dominated by the maximum eigenvalue, and some constant that will depend on x. So that has to be also finite. And then you see that it's all dominated by, in time, by the zeta max, and this is why you have this. Okay? The proof is exactly, if you work with Markov chains, you, exactly, you have exactly the same structure. In that case, this, this zeta max is really just the pair of Frobenius applied to a matrix, a positive matrix. Here, I'm doing the same. You could discretize in time in order to construct the Markov chain and then apply per classical Perron Frobenius theory to get the result. But what I'm showing here is that you don't have to do this. Mathematically, you can just keep in continuous time, and then what you have to do is to use Feynman Katz to get that result. Okay? Questions? Okay, so now I have a spectral problem. What is the spectral? Okay, and then one thing I haven't mentioned here. Yes. 
Yes, yes, that's a good point actually. But this will show up in the lambda k. Lambda k will be defined up to some k max. And the k max, the divergence, like the, the, the regions of convergence of the lambda k will be defined by the exponential tails there. You're right, yes. But it's all, it's all built in in the lambda k. You could have actually, the, the, the eigenvalue here could, could exist on the regions of convergence bigger than the regions of convergence of, of lambda k. So the result I should, I should write here is that k is in the regions of convergence of lambda k. This is really important, in fact, and then you've worked on this yourself. Okay, for instance, you could have a fluctuation relation for all k real, but in fact, you only have it a restricted fluctuation relation for the lambda k itself. Okay. Okay. Okay, so another thing I wanted to mention is that you see here I've done the theory only for the additive part in time. This is the classical result for Feynman cats. Okay, cats never looked at observable that, that actually are expressed as a stochastic integral. But you could do, you can redo the calculation, you can redo the derivation of the Feynman Katz formula. And what you get is that the tilted generator here, the Feynman Katz generator, is this one. Okay, and then you just use stochastic calculus to get there. So this generator, the, the interpretation of this generator is that this is the generator of the evolution of the generating function. So L itself, is the generator of the evolution of functionals of the process. L dagger is the generator of the evolution of the marginal density of the process. LK, the tilted generator, is the generator of the generating function. Yes. Yes. Because you could, you could transform the Ito integral to a Stratonovich integral plus another part which you can put in the, in the time integral. So whether you use Stratonovich or two doesn't really matter. So this is, this is where it, it joins up with the question of 3D. Is what do you need as a condition in order to get this? And this is related, in fact, to the large deviations. If you have just a continuous spectrum without gap, you're not even expecting to have an LDP. Okay? So these things are all related together. If I have a gap, for sure I have an LDP. Okay, because I'm going to have this exponential dominance in the long time limit. But these are really non-trivial questions, that, and they're all related. The existence of the LDP, the spectral property of the tilted generator, and so on. Okay, so I have, I have one minute left. I just want to write down what is the spectral problem that we need to solve, and then what we'll do tomorrow is to kind of think about solving this for a particular case. And so you get an idea of the, of the difficulty of finding large deviations. So the spectral problem I need to solve now in order to get the large deviation is, is the problem to get the dominant eigenvalue. So I have a tilted generator. I need to find a dominant eigenvalue, which I'm going to write lambda k. And the corresponding eigenfunction is the function related to the, so this is the dominant eigenvalue, and this is the eigenfunction related to the eigenvalue. I'm going to call it RK because it's the right eigenfunction. Okay. Um, however, I need to define the I need to define the boundary conditions. What are the boundary conditions for this? It's a spectral problem. What are the boundary conditions? If LK was just an emission operator, I would say RK has to decay to zero to infinity. But here it's not emission, so there's no boundary condition only on RK. This, now, the boundary conditions will have to be defined also with the dual problem that has the same eigenvalue. But the boundary condition is neither on R or on L, it's on the product This at the boundary has to be zero. So this, when x goes to infinity, in, in most cases that we consider, has to go to zero. So this is the boundary condition. It's not a quantum-like boundary condition. Because again, you have, you're dealing with a non-emission. If it's emission, you see the L will be the same as, 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 as R, so it's R squared that will go to infinity, that will go to zero at infinity, just like in quantum mechanics. 
Okay, so when you think about this, the reason why in quantum mechanics the wave function has to decay to zero at infinity is not because the particle is not found at infinity. It's just because mathematically it's the boundary term in the integration by part that has to be zero. And so that says that the function, the product of the two functions, has to be zero on the boundary. If the boundary is at infinity, then you want the product of the two functions to be zero at infinity. And if you think about this, this is a very difficult spectral problem now. I'm not solving only this with some boundary conditions. I have to solve two problems with a combined boundary, boundary condition. Okay, so this is what we'll try to do tomorrow. Um, I have this. Then I need to normalize, and I'll finish with this, maybe just one more minute or half a minute if I can. So this is the decay, the boundary condition. And then for the normalization, it's up to you. There are many different normalizations, and the one I used, actually, the one I used for the Feynman cats is this one. I want this to be equal to 1, and I want the integral of L dx also to be equal to 1. But this is, this is arbitrary. Okay, you can just use other normalization. Of course, they're eigenvectors, so you can, you can normalize them in, in any way, but in the normalization I used, then this is what you would get here. There's, on, there's no V, because the V actually is integrated over 1. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop here, and I'll just continue tomorrow slightly to present an example of this, and then we'll go into the prediction problem of, of the conditioning, how a fluctuation is created. Here we just calculated the probability of a fluctuation. What's more important physically is to understand how a given fluctuation is created dynamically in time. Thank you. So I'll start with a question about those uh, dynamical observables that you're looking at. For uh, jump processes on discrete state spaces, it's it's fairly easy to see that that's the if you have a a state part and then a part that only depend on the jumps, you get the whole class of functions that are additive in time. So if you take a path, you cut it in half, and you look at the observable on the two parts, the sum is the observable on the whole path. In this case, do you get the whole class of those uh, time additive observables, or is there more in it? Mm, I think I would phrase it differently. Like for, for a jump process, if you look at an observable that depends on the state plus an observable that depends on the jump, then if you look at this, and then you put this in the feynman katz formula, then you still have a feynman katz equation. If you look some, at something that depends on three states in time, you're going to lose that multiplicative structure. So in a way, what I'm doing is I'm asking, what is the class of observable that keeps the feynman katz equation? So Katz would tell you, well, it's this. What I'm telling you now is that if you add now h with a stochastic integral, you also keep the multiplicative structure. So what I'm considering is kind of the largest class of observable that keeps the multiplicative structure of the underlying Markov process. So that's all you can do. That you can't have like a dx squared or crazy uh, stuff. Well, it has to be meaningful even in a stochastic calculus sense. But but yes, yes. But for, for yes. But um, yes, I, th I think you can go beyond. Like, so like the, the process level, the level three of large deviation actually doesn't fall into that. But what I'm saying is that in order for me to use spectral analysis to get a large deviation, then this is the class of observable. It's, yes. you, could, you could define, even for a Markov process, a kind of observable of this form. A G that depends on Xi, Xi plus one, and Xi plus two. Maybe actually you have some application that, that, that you know, leads you to this observable. You're not, you could find the large deviation principle of the large deviation property of this, okay, minus two, uh, but it's not going to be from, from Perron Frobenius or from spectral calculation because you're losing the multiplicative structure of the Markov process when you look at this. But you could contract the, the triple empirical distribution if you had the rate function of this, yes. So, again, about the question there with a dominant eigenvalue, I don't fully understand why, if there is no spectral gap, why there will not be an LDP. I would, I would feel that the LK would be some integral with respect to some measure of this whole set of eigenvalues or something. There could be an LDP. No, yeah. Maybe I should. So, here the, the gap will be sufficient then to get an LDP, yes. But it might not be necessary. In fact, there, there is a case if you look at the some functionals of pure Brownian motion that will give you an LDP, but Brownian motion itself doesn't have a gap. Yes.
So I think, again, the relation between the LDP and the spectral problem is really subtle. The, I guess that the case, the important case for us in physics is really the gap case. But it, there's something beyond for sure, yeah. Yeah, I think so, yeah. It, I don't need a real spectrum, I don't need... So in fact, the, the, the reversibility is somewhat related also to the, the other eigenvalues. The dominant eigenvalue will be real, but you could have a, a, a complex eigenvalues, and the complex eigenvalues will come in conjugate pairs because the generating function is a real function. Um, and and the, the fact, whether you have a real spectrum or complex spectrum is related to that reversibility property. For instance, a gradient system, even though the generator is not emission, has a real spectrum, and then we'll talk about this tomorrow. So the, the theorem doesn't talk anything about the spectrum. It just assumes that given lambda k... k so the gartner Euler's theorem is not even about the spectrum. It doesn't say given that this ex lambda k exists. gartner Euler's is for any random variable at. I'm not even defining what at is. It says that if I can calculate this and it's differentiable, then I have the LDP and the, the rate function. It's just that how do you calculate this for a Markov process? Then the, this is a separate result and this is the, the Perron Frobenius, then lambda k is related to a dominant eigenvalue. But there's nothing, there's no, there's not even a notion of Markov process in the Gartner Ellis. It's anything. It could be an it could be a non-Markovian process, and this could be anything. As long as you can calculate lambda k, if you can do this, then you're gonna have an LDP. But it's a very general uh, result. Sorry? So Yeah, it's implicit in the generating function. You see, the generating function has to exist. This is not a Fourier transform. This is a Laplace transform. So uh, it's not a characteristic function. It's a generating function. So it implies some moment conditions. Essentially, the, the moments have to be finite. If you have a divergent second moment, there's no LDP. That's Sanjib, yeah? No, so... The Gartner version is lambda k defined everywhere and differentiable everywhere. What Ellis did is to say, no, no, it has to be defined only in an open interval around k equals zero, and then there's a steepness condition on the regions of convergence plus the differentiability. So there are some technical conditions that are weaker than Gartner, but quite technical, and that, that's the contribution of Ellis. Uh -huh. And this is related also to non-convex rate function. Uh -huh. Okay. Clément. Are there no other techniques than uh, using the gartner ellis theorem to get the yeah. large deviation? In yes, the other important one is the contraction principle. If I know, um, in fact, Frank has mentioned the contraction principle a lot last week. If I know the large deviations of the empirical density and the empirical current, this is what we call level 2.5, if I know the large deviations of these two objects, then I can, I can find any contraction of these two objects, and that's the class of AT that I was defining there. That's very useful too. For instance, if, if you're after non-convex rate function, you cannot use gartner Elias. How do you get non-convex function? By contraction. And there are other techniques too, actually. Any other questions? I have a last one about the corrections to the ah. after the uh, large deviation function. So the first correction uh, is is in principle is is constant in time, and that's that's a prefactor to the or not necessarily could be a not lot necessarily. Key, it's um, it, it's not much general you can say. Or if if I have a normal large deviation. What you expect from the Gaussian nature of the around the, the minimum point is that you're going to have a square root t in front just by normalization. This is what you expect in general. Um, but I, 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 I can't say anything general. It's not known. It's a case-by-case -case thing. Some people have done specific calculation for process to get the corrections, and they get the explicit factor here. You can use path integrals, for instance, to get the, the correction. And in fact, the correction you get from path integral is square root of time. Okay. But it could be something else. You, you cannot just say a, a blank statement about, statement about the corrections. I don't think you can say anything very general about this. And that, sorry, that correction could have poles? It could have poles. You can run in trouble have, with the... You can, you can have a mixture of large deviation principles with different corrections. Anything can happen, I think. It's, it's, it's quite open. And what's the weirdest example that you... 
I don't know. I, I, I'm not too familiar with corrections for the time-dependent process. I know, for instance, the Ising model. Ising model with the number of spins as, say, a rate function for the magnetization. Above the phase transition, so high temperature, you get a normal large deviations. Below the, 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 the temperature, uh, so below the phase transition, in the Ising model, it's been calculated at square root of n. Okay, so you have in the rate function for the magnetization, it goes from minus 1 to 1. You have below the phase transition, a whole region of 0. And so in this, the scaling is square root of n. It's a surface effect. It's not a volume effect. And so this has been, this has been calculated explicitly by contraction of the level 3 process level. Okay, it's quite a... Very, it's, it's an impressive calculation, but this is what you get. Physically, it makes sense, of course. Um, you have a... I guess if it is T, then it's always square root of T, right? If I just assume that you are just getting from a saddle point. Uh... Yeah, this is what you expect in general. But if suppose you're close to, if you have a rate function that, that is not quadratic around the minimum, then the normalization will give you something else. No, but I didn't say normalization, but what I'm saying is when you go from me, uh, the, your lambda to the rate function... So uh, there's nothing... The lambda cannot give me that part, huh? No, because this your legendary Frankel transformation. I can also think of it as a saddle point. Uh, yes, but that gives me only the saddle point will give me this. Corrections to the saddle point will give me this. No, I think that when you do the saddle point integral, there's a Gaussian integral to be done. Yes. And Gaussian integral will give you a square root of Yeah, t. but you have a Gaussian integral. You're assuming a Gaussian integral, and the assumption of Gaussian integral means that locally you have Gaussian fluctuations. Yeah. If I have locally non-Gaussian fluctuations, I could have another normalization there for the, yes. And I, I cannot just take that case away. It can happen. In fact, I know I can, I can construct things that have this rate function. Yeah. It's important. I would say the corrections are important for two reasons. One is um, what Sandeep was mentioning. If you're after more precise estimation of probabilities, if for you it's very critical to get uh, uh, a, a good estimation of probabilities, because you see a large deviation approximation doesn't give you really an actual number for the probability. It's just a scaling of the probability. If you're after very precise, then you need corrections. Another thing is that if the rate function is zero itself, then you need to look at the corrections. Okay. You have a large deviation principle, it's just you have no information in it. It tells you that it's zero. So there's no more questions. Let's thank Hugo again. Thank you.